Um, thank you very much, uh, Tadesh. Um, well, we're going to have two presentations. In fact, one about um, um, some alchemical materials in the um, National Library of Israel and uh, one about um, some theological or um, mythological or some other way we might choose to describe them materials in the collections of um, the National Library of Israel, both of which, um, which uh, in both cases, of course, are materials produced by Isaac Newton. Um, and the context for both my involvement and the involvement of um, Bill Newman uh, in uh, this, the with these uh, materials, the immediate context is um, a project that uh, both Bill Newman and I are involved in, um, which hopes to improve the imaging of watermarks and the processing of images of watermarks using um, both uh, up-to-date uh, imaging technology and up-to-date um, digital processing technology um, and um, artificial intelligence. Um, to help us in the long run to be able to use the material uh, evidence of Newton's manuscripts uh, better to understand uh, their composition and uh, better to see their, the place of materials which uh, are now part of a highly distributed archive, uh, distributed not just amongst the National, the National Library of Israel, but across a very many uh, very many reposit repositories in um, Britain and the United States, particularly, uh, to begin to pull that together also uh, to see it as Newton's archive rather than as a series of discrete items within the collections of the holding institutions. So um, to begin today, therefore, I'd like to introduce my colleague on that project, Professor um, Bill Newman, who is Professor um, distinguished professor indeed of the history of science at the University of Indiana um, and who has published extremely widely um, across the whole field of interpretation of um, medieval and early modern and even uh, later um, alchemy or as he and those of us who have learnt from it from him have come to think of it at least with regard to the early modern period, um, chemistry, uh, and uh, who has uh, particularly devoted himself um, for a good part of his career to the understanding of the ideas of 17th century English uh, chemists, um, principally uh, English and American chemists, principally George Starkey um, and uh, Robert Boyle, and also, above all, uh, in his two... 2019 book uh, on the alchemy of Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton. And I think Bill is, um, so Bill, the floor is yours, I think is probably the best way to continue. Thanks very much, Scott. Let me set up my screen share. Well, <clears throat> As all of you no doubt know, Isaac Newton was not only a consummate physicist and a dedicated writer on religious topics, he was also a devoted aspirant to the Philosopher's Stone. Newton spent some 40 years deciphering the highly figurative literature of alchemy while also testing his interpretations of the adepts in the laboratory. We know this today primarily from the million or so words that Newton left behind in manuscript form that deal with the secrets of the alrific art. Despite the fact that these manuscripts all concern alchemy, they vary considerably in content and style, ranging from copies and abridgments of printed alchemical texts to commentaries on those texts, and in some cases, even presenting dated experimental notebooks that would not be out of place in a modern laboratory. In fact, Newton's laboratory notebooks are so precise that I've been able to replicate a number of the procedures recorded in them, leading from uh, corrosive solutions of antimony 
to the production of crystalline vitriols made by dissolving materials in these solutions and allowing them slowly to crystallize, and to salts of metals that can be volatilized at moderately high temperatures in an apparatus like this. The bulk of Newton's alchemical manuscripts were seen by only a handful of modern viewers until they were sold to various bidders in the famous 1936 auction of his unpublished papers held by Sotheby's. While some of them were disengaged and sold in fragmentary form, we are fortunate to have several intact collections of alchemical booklets that Newton wrote and then gathered together in the form of packets. One of the most interesting of these gatherings is found today in the National Library of Israel. I refer to the collection of 12 folded pamphlets that go collectively by the shelf mark VAR 259. This fascinating collection will form the subject of my talk today. As you can see from this image, Newton himself compiled a sort of table of contents for VAR 259, which he wrote on the outside of the wrapper that surrounds the manuscripts within. The 12 titles refer to texts and authors that Newton individually summarized and wrote commentaries on. VAR 259 is not a laboratory notebook, but an attempt to decipher the secrets of the adepts by literary means. This immediately raises several important questions. First, were the 12 booklets collected within this makeshift cover all composed around the same time, or were they written down at various times and then collected together afterwards by Newton? Second, if the manuscripts making up VAR 259 were composed at divergent periods in Newton's alchemical career, can we make any conjecture as to the dates at which the contents of VAR 259 were written? Did they fall at an early or a late stage in Newton's long alchemical career? And third, what motivated Newton to collect them together? My audience should bear in mind the considerable size of Newton's alchemical corpus. Why did he choose to bring these particular 12 manuscripts under one cover? Although I do not have time to solve these puzzles today in a definitive fashion, I hope at least to present some clues that are more than suggestive. So let's proceed to question number one. Were the contents of VAR 259 written at one go, or were they composed separately and then gathered together later? A quick glance strongly suggests the latter alternative. Each of the booklets consists of synopses or commentary on a particular printed alchemical book or multiple books, and the synopsis or commentary never passes over from one pamphlet to the next. In other words, each of the booklets is a self-contained unit. Consider the first booklet in VAR 259. It consists of a French adaptation of the German alchemist Jodocus von Rea his process, which was printed numerous times in the 17th century. The text ends six pages before the end of the pamphlet, and Newton left three pages blank. Pamphlet number, number two, shown here, consists of a Latin abridgment of the secret book attributed to one Artafius. The Latin text, taken from a 1612 work, called Trois Traités de la Philosophie Naturelle, fills the entire pamphlet. It's not carried over to pamphlet number three, which consists of an English abbreviation of the alchemical hieroglyphics attributed to the 14th century Parisian scribe Nicolas Flamel. The Flamel text likewise fills its pamphlet entirely and terminates with a lovely image that Newton copied faithfully from the printed version of Flamel's hieroglyphics. So in the first three booklets of VAR 259, we have three different authors whose works written in three distinct languages, French, Latin, and English, do not overlap from booklet to booklet. This pattern is maintained throughout the remaining pamphlets making up VAR 259, which I do not have time to discuss here. It certainly looks as if the pamphlets had nothing to do with one another and that Newton collected them together for his own reasons. At what point or points in time did Newton write the 12 pamphlets making up VAR 259? 
Well, there are a number of indicators that one could use to help answer this question. The first and most obvious is content. The seventh and 11th pamphlet contain what appear to be some of Newton's earliest notes on two famous alchemists, namely George Starkey and Basilius Valentinus. Let's look at pamphlet number seven first. This is Newton's brief commentary on the marrow of alchemy, an English poem written by the American alchemist George Starkey and published in two parts in 1654 and 55 under the pseudonym of Irenaeus Philolathes. That is Greek for a peaceful lover of truth. Here's an image from Starkey's collected works under the name of Philolathes. As you can see, Newton, uh, initially disagreed with Starkey's description of himself as a lover of truth. For Newton identified the marrow at the top right underneath the uh, deletion marks as a false poem. But then Newton thought better of this pejorative judgment. He crossed the negative comment out and in fact never repeats the accusation in VAR 259. In fact, if one consults the remainder of Newton's edited alchemical writings, about 750,000 words, one will find the Marrow of Alchemy became one of his favorite texts. From this single instance of doubt in VAR 259, I suggest that the manuscript represents Newton's earliest interaction with the Marrow of Alchemy and that he overcame his doubts about the author as soon as he immersed himself in the poem. A similarly early encounter with an alchemical author can be seen in the case of VAR 259's 11th pamphlet. This manuscript contains 13 folios in which Newton has carefully written multiple versions of notes on the supposedly 15th century Benedictine Basilius Valentinus's 12 keys, reflecting at least three successive readings of the text in the 1660s 1657 English edition of Basilius's last will and testament. And there is a fictive and idealized portrait of this Benedictine monk who never actually existed, by the way. At any rate, each set of notes in VAR 259.11 bears its own title. B. Valentine's Process, F. B. Valentine's 12 Keys, and B. Valentine's 12 Keys. In addition, Newton notes that, excuse me, Newton's notes include two readings of commentary based mainly on the elucidation or declaration of the 12 keys, also found in the 1657 printing, which he entitles B. Valentine's Process and B. Valentine's Process described in his 12 keys and other writings. Finally, the manuscript presents Newton's numbered analysis of the last will and testament in the form of an index titled References to B. Valentine's Works and a final section called Things Remarkable in B. Valentine's Works. So the highly structured formal character of the note strongly suggests the influence of Newton's experience as a student at Cambridge. The three successive series of notes on Basilius's 12 keys, the two on the elucidation, and especially the numbered set of things remarkable or observations are all redolent of the structured way in which English undergraduates of the 17th century were taught to organize their readings. A generation earlier, Richard Holdsworth, master of Emmanuel College at Cambridge, had composed a popular set of directions for a student in the university. Holdsworth's directions present detailed instructions for taking notes on paper books where the scholar should abbreviate and contract the sense of the author being studied. Newton's early synopses fulfill that mandate practically to the letter, but his mature alchemical notes do not display this overtly scholastic character. So to make matters short, the content and style of pamphlet 11 reveals a young Newton not far from his undergraduate education and the tutelary advice that went with it. So we've seen then that at least two of the booklets in VAR 259 are probably quite early, 
pamphlets 7 and 11 may even predate Newton's famous acquisition of the multi-volume Theatrum Chemicum in 1669, which has been thought by some scholars to mark the beginning of his serious interest in alchemy. What about the other booklets that make up VAR 259? Are they of a similarly early origin? Two of the pamphlets, namely numbers 9 and 12, actually refer to the Theatrum Chemicum and therefore do not in all likelihood predate 1669. But they are still likely to be products of the 1670s. In order to demonstrate this, I have to move from content to physical clues provided by Newton's handwriting. I do not refer to the style of his hand, such as whether it is vertical, cramped, or flowing. Over the history of Newton's scholarship, observations about his evolving script have often led to Im impressionistic and misleading claims when applied to chronology. What I have in mind, rather, is the evolution of his graphic symbols. As I've argued in my recent book, Newton the Alchemist, the dated entries in Newton's two laboratory notebooks kept at the Cambridge University Library make it possible to see when Newton moved from using an unbarred Saturn symbol, such as the, the two you see here, to the more common barred version of the symbol, here taken from one of his laboratory notebooks. In fact, Newton abandoned the unbarred Saturn symbol at some time around 1674. This has important implications for the chronology of Newton's alchemical manuscripts. It means, in short, that we have a reliable marker for determining if a particular manuscript fell roughly before or after 17, 1674, excuse me, by determining the presence or absence of the unbarred Saturn symbol. Of course, there are also cases of manuscripts where both symbols occur. Uh, in cases where they are vastly outnumbered, the unbarred ones by the barred ones, one can assume that the unbarred ones are slips of the pen. Where barred and unbarred Saturns are more or less evenly distributed, on the other hand, one may assume that the manuscript in question falls in an intermediate period around 1674, when Newton was shifting his graphic preference from one symbol to the other. By using the search functionality of the digitized version of VAR 259, one finds the following distribution. As you can see, only one unbarred, excuse me, only one barred Saturn is found in the entirety of VAR 259. This unusual paucity of the barred Saturn symbol lies in contrast to 52 instances of the unbarred Saturn symbol. The obvious inference is that the majority of the texts in VAR 256, excuse me, VAR 259 predate 1674, which places them in the very early phase of Newton's 40-year-long alchemical career. But what about VAR 259.10, the one text that contains the barred version of the Saturn symbol? As it turns out, this is Newton's synopsis of the Commentatio de Pharmaco Catholico by the obscure German alchemist Johann de Monte Snyder's. Another of Monte Snyder's works, The Metamorphosis of the Planets, would become one of Newton's most important sources during the 1680s. And here is Newton's copy of the uh, frontispiece to The Metamorphosis Planetarum, which is now held by Yale University Library. But Newton's alchemical notes make it clear that he had access to the commentatio before he possessed the metamorphosis. How long before? Monte Snyder's work was printed as part of the Cumica Vanus, or chemical candle, published in Amsterdam in 1666. So Newton's abridgment is unlikely to be earlier than that time. Yet, if we consult the printed text, a very interesting fact emerges. In each of the four instances where Newton has written the unbarred Saturn, the Latin imprint gives the verbal form of the word Saturnus or an inflected form and not the graphic symbol. 
For example, you can see here in Newton's commentary on the Commentatio, he has used the unbarred Saturn. And here you can see in Monty Snyder's printed text, there is no symbol. He's spelled out Saturnus. The one case where Newton has written the barred Saturn symbol in VAR 259 is also the sole corresponding case where Monty Snyder's does use a graphic symbol. It is where he lays out his simple alphabet of symbols. Here is Newton's copy, and you can see the barred Saturn at top left. And here is Monty Snyder's printing, which also has a, a form of barred Saturn. So this is followed, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in Monty Snyder's by what he calls uh, chemical syllables. <clears throat> and um, what Monty Snyder's has done here is to try to build up further graphical symbols from the parts of the planetary glyphs like that of Saturn. This of course reflects a tradition that goes back to the hieroglyphic monad or monas hieroglyphica of the Egyptian astrologer, magician and alchemist, John Dee. Here is a page from John Dee's Monas Hieroglyphica, where you can see he has disassembled his hieroglyphic monad symbol into the symbol for the moon at top, the crescent, the dotted circle representing the sun, and a cross beneath that representing the four elements, followed by a bracket representing the element fire. The fact that Newton copied Monty Snyder's barred Saturn with a surmounting cross intact is therefore no accident. It reflects the high importance that Monty Snyder's placed on the crossbar. The single occurrence of the barred Saturn in VAR 259 does not reflect Newton's own usage at the time the manuscript was written. It's an aberration reflecting Newton's precise unaltered copying of the Monty Snyder symbol. So the result of all this examination is that VAR 259 appears to consist solely of parts that were composed before 1674, when Newton shifted his allegiance from the unbarred Saturn to the barred Saturn. One would obviously like to confirm this claim by analysis of other physical features in VAR 259, such as the use that Newton made there of Latin diacritics, reminiscent of his school boy days, and of course, the various watermarks that can be found throughout the manuscript. The present watermark project being carried out jointly by the Chemistry of Isaac Newton project and the Newton project will of course allow just the sort of watermark analysis that is needed, but for the moment, the work remains to be done. We may now turn briefly to the third and final question that I raised at the start of this discussion. Why did Newton collect these particular manuscripts together and provide them with a detailed table of contents? The answer is not obvious given the multiple authors and diverse languages involved. But the fact that all these documents seem clearly to stem from the very early phases of Newton's career suggests a possible reason. Perhaps he meant to organize his corpus of alchemical manuscripts chronologically and grouped them accordingly, or at least began to do so. The chaos that ensued from the division of the manuscripts in the 1936 Sotheby's auction may well have obscured this organizational principle with VAR 259 possibly being one of the few manuscripts to retain it. With that thought, I conclude. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, and um, thank you for providing also an introduction to some of the work of um, that we're undertaking together uh, and some of its purposes. And the presentation that I'm going to give um, in some ways follows on from that um, and will also perhaps introduce some of the difficulties of using watermark evidence, um, which uh, difficulties which are complicated further by the dispersal of material of the kind that Bill 
um, has just referred to. And like Bill, the Bill's presentation, the presentation that I'm going to give um, is um, engages in trying to work out what, what it is that Newton himself was trying to do uh, when uh, he was writing the manuscripts uh, that uh, now survive and what processes of organization were of, in, of information were going on in his head or physically across his desk at the time that he was doing that. Um, so uh, the presentation I'm going to give is, is uh, delivered by me, but it's the result of joint work in some ways with a very large number of people, but particularly with somebody who is on this call, um, Derek Mosley, um, who has worked uh, with me very extensively on um, the uh, way in which uh, Newton uh, read the printed books uh, in his library and the usefulness of the printed books from Newton's library that survive above all in the library of Trinity College Cambridge um, might have for an understanding of Newton's ideas. So although I'm going to deliver this um, talk for the next 20 minutes or so, um, the talk is very largely the work of, of, of Derek as well as of me. Um, and so I'm going to share my screen and then um, take you through um, the ideas that uh, I've uh, already suggested we're going to consider. So the talk that um, Derek and I have put together discusses uh, a manuscript in um, the collections of the National Library of Israel, Yehuda Manuscript 16.2. Um, and, um, oh dear, I've managed to misspell it. Um, to, and the, um, the um, interpretation placed on it by Newton scholars since um, the definitive biography of Newton, which was published by Richard S. Westfall in 1980. And Westfall uh, had uh, developed uh, an interpretation of this manuscript, which he called the um, Theologiae Gentilis Origines, not Origines, sorry, Philosophicae, um, the um, theological origins of Gentile, um, the, the philosophical origins, the theological origins of Gentile philosophy, um, which uh, he um, interpreted very importantly as uh, West, Westfall interpreted this manuscript as being the key to understanding Isaac Newton's thinking in religion and uh, the key to understanding what he was therefore doing with a very large number of the books that eventually came to populate his library in the second half of his life. Um, Westfall thought uh, that this manuscript, fairly obvious reasons, uh, had to be dated to sometime around the end of the 1680s, although were, he wasn't sure when work on it might have begun. The fairly obvious reasons were that the manuscript is written, as we shall see, in the hand of a man called Humphrey Newton, no relationship, no relation to Isaac Newton, but, or no close relation to Isaac Newton, but someone who worked uh, as Newton's amanuensis in the 1680s in Cambridge. And Humphrey Newton was the person responsible for producing the final draft of the Principia, as well as the person responsible for writing this manuscript. Um, so it is um, naturally interesting to try um, and associate him with the development of Newton's ideas in theology. Now for uh, Westfall, um, this manuscript is the indicator of the beginnings of Newton's um, heterodoxy in theology, or at least the evidence of the full-blown nature of Newton's heterodoxy in theology in uh, the 1680s, and it sparked a large debate in which, which Westfall um, didn't entirely discourage about what form of um, unorthodox or heterodox uh, Christian Newton might be, and whether a Newton is best, was best understood as a deist, or best understood as an Arian. 
Now, um, as will become apparent in the course of what I and Derek and I have to say, um, we have hesitations about um, all the aspects of that presentation by Westfall and about all the um, and those who have subsequently followed him in regarding this manuscript as representing a particular key to Newton's activities. Um, and we want to use some of the physical evidence, but also some of the reading evidence in the same way that Bill has just done to try to make uh, better sense of the manuscript. Um, so um, if I could begin just by thinking about uh, a group, the group of people uh, with whom Newton was engaging on the topic of theology at the time uh, that he wrote this manuscript whenever he wrote it in the 1680s. Um, those people were his Cambridge uh, contemporaries, and you can see them located here on a map of the little town of Cambridge produced, uh, well, printed in 1690 and circulated in 1690 by the engraver David Logan. Um, and they are probably in order of their influence of, on Newton and certainly in reverse order of their importance in the University of Cambridge. Um, Henry Moore, uh, a fellow of Christ's College, uh, who was very familiar with the sorts of note-taking practice uh, that Bill has introduced us to, and with whom uh, Newton engaged in discussion about the interpretation of the prophecies, particularly the pro prophecies of Daniel and the Apocalypse, uh, on which subject Moore was engaged uh, for much of his life uh, and published extensively, in fact, in the six, at the end of the 1670s and 1680s, by which time Newton had uh, publicly disagreed with him, or at least privately disagreed with him and possibly publicly disagreed with him about that interpretation. And Newton had certainly publicly disagreed with him about the importance of Cartesian philosophy, which is another question in the background to the interpretation of some of these, this material. Moore was a major proponent of Descartes' philosophy in contemporary Cambridge, although he was also in some ways a critic of Descartes. Um, and it may be that one needs to situate this manuscript along with other work that Newton was doing in the 1680s as a move, part of his move away from uh, the forms of Cartesianism that Moore and others embraced. The second man is Ralph Cudworth, um, sometimes Moore's colleague, but also important in other contexts in the university and professor of Hebrew in the university and the author of an enormous study of ancient philosophy designed to combat some of the newest forms of Christian heresy, particularly anti-Trinitarian heresies that were circulating in the university and elsewhere at the time, and to reassert the, um, uh, the appropriateness of links between uh, Christian and pagan philosophy uh, as embodied particularly in the writings of um, the early fathers and to advance what a, a correct understanding of this, a project on which Newton himself would spend a very considerable time after 1680. The third man, John Spencer, and slightly younger, um, fellow of Corpus Christi College, was um, a successor of um, uh, Cudworth as a professor of Hebrew, and like Cudworth, was heavily involved in the teaching of theology at the University of Cambridge. Spencer is important both because of his publications of the 1680s uh, uh, in particular, and because of his support for Newton, uh, along, a support shared with uh, Cudworth at the time of the glorious revolution. So we know that Spencer and Cudworth both were active friends of Newton's throughout the 1680s, active in university politics in support of Newton, for example. Spencer is also interesting because some of his ways of reading books, the physical ways in which he read books, in particular dog-earing their pages, bear some similarities to the way in which Newton read books. So this is really, this slide really shows uh, the development of, of the process that I've just talked about. It shows the locations within Cambridge uh, 
of these men. Uh, John's, um, again, reading from right to left of Cudworth, of um, Henry Moore, and of John Spencer. And it shows the most important of their philosophical publications and their publications that relate also to the interpretation of Christian and Jewish evidence about the history of philosophy um, and the way in which um, the history of philosophy should be understood within the processes of the creation of the Christian religion and the uh, and also of people's broader understandings of the way in which um, God regulates the world, both uh, as a philosophical system and as a legal and moral system. Which brings us to some of Newton's writings um, conducted in this location in Trinity front of Trinity College, Cambridge, uh, probably slightly actually to the right of uh, the, the dot uh, on the, in Newton's first floor rooms, which communicated by the staircase, uh, which is shown in the arcade behind the first of the trees uh, to the laboratory building, possibly the building on the right hand side by the chapel where Newton conducted his alchemy. And um, it, really um, this story begins with um, inquiries that Newton has um, as a consequence of his work on um, celestial motion and on the effects of um, and the motion of bodies more generally, which he's working up in a manuscript that he's thinking about in around 1684, the day um, uh, the day motu, and um, which he uh, which leads him also to ask questions of the uh, astronomer royal John Flamsteed and of other uh, natural philosophers, including his friend Edmund Halley and astronomers. Um, about celestial motion. And in the letter that's cited here, uh, shown here from Flamsteed to Newton on the 26th of September, 1685, um, Flamsteed is dealing with a query from Newton about the motion of the satellites of Jupiter, potentially also the motion of the satellites of Saturn, if, if they can be determined, although Fra Flamsteed says that Newton will need to ask Christian Hauchens about that. The significance of, of that letter, which fits exactly into the program of intensive work, which Newton begins towards the Principia, building outwards from um, materials which he presents as being the same as lectures that he was giving as Lucasian professor in Cambridge, towards eventually the published work, one of whose effects, as we've said, is to repudiate certain forms of Cartesianism. The significance of Flamsteed's letter is that it is cited directly in the uh, on the page um, heavily damaged by water or some other, possibly by fire as well, um, of Cambridge University Library manuscript ad 3965, um, folio 652. Um, that's one of the pages which is associated with this phase of drafting the Principia. And Flamsteed's uh, comments from Flamsteed's letter are incorporated there directly. But if one turns the page, uh, one finds uh, incorporated on the same sheet an extensive discussion of the astronomical uh, significance and, ast and mythological reading through astronomy of a series of ancient figures. And here one can tie, as um, Derek has uh, very closely uh, in the slide in front of you, Newton's reading and Newton's writing in presumably not much after September, 1685. And one finds Newton uh, reading and dog-earing, and here, if you didn't understand the reference to dog-ears, you can see a clear example, um, work produced uh, by the Arminian um, um, classicist and theologian uh, Gerardus Ioannis Vossius um, on the um, history of Gentile um, theology and philosophy. And uh, one can find uh, 
passages uh, which uh, then reappear directly in some of uh, Newton's later and post uh, and and um, and subsequently unpublished further reworkings of uh, De Motu and on and studies of the motion of bodies uh, again written in the context of the Principia of the drafting of the Principia so that one can see here a clear interplay between questions about the interpretation of um, ancient philosophy and the potential mythological and theological interpretations of that, uh, which are in the context of the reading of ancient astronomy and its significance, uh, which are presented by Henry Moore, reworked by Newton in the context of his thinking, early thinking about the drafting of the Principia and the astronomical questions that derive from his physics as presented there, and feeding into reading that Newton seems to be doing at exactly that time in um, some of the most important works that introduce him to the ideas about ancient mythology and about the way that both Jews and Christians have read and interpreted that uh, as presented above all by the work of Fossius. And the work that in a sense ties of, in Newton's library that ties these interests together and to which Newton and which Newton revisited uh, at this time, having probably looked at it a little bit earlier um, is uh, and which helps to shape Newton's remarkable and idiosyncratic reading of this material um, is um, a book by a, a, an Eng another English lay theologian, John Marsham and lay chronologer, John Marsham, um, a Kentish writer um, whose um, Canon Chronicus, whose study of the chronology of the Egyptians, the Hebrews, and the Greeks, uh, which remarkably privileged uh, Egyptian an Egyptian chronology, and which also um, remarkably shortened the chronology of the ancient world in a manner which Newton later emulated, um, was first published. Uh, in uh, uh, the um, immediate aftermath of the Great Fire of London, the early, uh, and was reprinted in Leipzig in 1676 in the copy that Newton owned. And here again, in the, that surviving copy, which is in the Linda Hall uh, Library in Kansas, Kansas City, um, you can see Newton dog earring relevant passages to precisely this discussion. That is uh, the discussions in uh, Achilles Tatius and other authors, ancient authors of um, the supposed uh, astronomical discoveries of um, Draco and the, uh, the, 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 the various interpretations of the sphere of the astronomical sphere presented by ancient authors. And again, you can see these picked up, these dog earrings picked up directly in quotations which appear in Newton's working manuscripts. So that one can uh, uh, draw up um, uh, in, if one looks at Yehuda 16.2, which comes out in, uh, is being written in the middle of this process and which represents Newton's most complete version to date of the study of ancient uh, philosophy and theology and the interpretation of ancient ideas about the nature of the heavens as uh, relating to um, the embodiment of an ancient mythology into what could be seen in the natural world. Um, one can see if one looks at this manuscript in Humphrey Newton's hand, uh, again, the direct influence of um, the books that Newton is reading, whether they be Marsham's Chronicus Canon at the top, or um, the uh, work which accompanied the work of uh, G.J. Vossius, the work of his son Dionysius Vossius in um, editing parts of Maimonides, uh, and which Newton also quarries very heavily for his version 
of the format of ancient worship, which appears in the manuscript. And you can see a production process going from notes, which are now in Yehuda 17.2, to drafts, which are in Yehuda 16.2. Um, and which you can also see a process of reading and response, which throws doubt on the idea that Yehuda 16.2 is as yet a finished treatise, rather than, as Westfall thought it was, rather than part of a series of manuscripts which contribute to the, contrib to, to the composition of the Principia at a time when Newton thought that this form of philosophical um, of history of philosophy and philosophical theology might have played a much larger role in that book. And that's a process which is normally associated, in fact, with a later revision of the Principia after its publication in 1687. Um, and uh, again, these, this slide shows the development of some of that, uh, particularly with re reference to um, Joseph Scaliger's edition of the ancient author Macrobius, who is again referred to by Cudworth and by Moore and by um, and who, who is part of this world of intellect of interpretation. What happens if we look at the watermark evidence? Um, these are not watermarks taken with the quality of photography that we hope to pioneer using the project that Bill and I are developing, but they allow us to say something about the material history of the pieces of paper that I've been talking about. So that sheet of paper in ad 3965 in the University of Cambridge Library, um, which, re which reuses part of uh, the information derived from a September 1685 letter from Flamsteed, um, bears this watermark uh, with the, uh, the watermark of the seven provinces of the Netherlands uh, with the countermark IV. And that combination of watermarks is also found uh, in the draft of the manuscript of the Principia written out by Humphrey Newton, which is now in the Royal Society. And it is also the paper on which Newton wrote his correspondence to Flamsteed in September, October, 1685. So that suggests very strongly that there is material evidence to support my claim, our claim, that those notes were made immediately on receipt of the letter from Flamsteed to which they refer, rather than at some much later date, and that they are indeed also part of the process of composition of the Principia. What about the similar watermark that we can find in Yehuda 16.2 folios 1 to 2 we've discussed? Again, it bears the watermark of um, the seven provinces, which is by no means um, uh, the only watermark, I should assure you, uh, watermark design on paper used by Newton. But in this case, uh, it's clearly a different paper stock because it has the countermark CDC. However, we can also tie the use of that paper directly to some items in the correspondence that led to the composition of the Principia, and that is to correspondence between Newton and Halley on the 18th of October 1686. So it's not impossible, at least, that uh, Yehuda 16.2 began to be composed in 1686 or even perhaps in 1685, um, dates certainly allowed for by the collaboration between Newton and Humphrey Newton, but dates much earlier than have uh, subsequently been suggested for the manuscript. Um, and dates that place it firm and the, con and the concerns that it displays firmly within the process of the composition of the first edition of the Principia, rather than secluding them to the unfinished and abandoned process of revision of the second edition of the Principia. And I hope this, this example um, provides some, of the, some evidence both for the importance of looking at watermarks within the total corpus of Newton's writings and uh, suggestions of some of the possible revisions of date and purposes of composition that might arise from taking them into account. Thank you. And so really now it's over to Tadej to suggest possible questions. <laughs>
Yes, uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation to all of you. Um, but actually, meanwhile, we do not have any questions. Uh, so I, I encourage our audience to send one, or if it's more comfortable for you, please raise your hand and I will unmute you in order to say this question loudly. Uh, it might be easier. Does anyone would like to ask the questions? Well, seems like no, um, at least not now. So maybe, uh, Scott, you could somehow refer to, to Bill's um, uh, presentation and maybe you can develop some additional uh, things around those presentations. Um, well, could I? I mean, could I just um, perhaps then get us started by by there is, I think, one question now, but I'll ask Bill a very, a very simple um, question, which um, some people might be interested in resulting from the pictures that he showed. It's not really the argument that he showed, but it's related, which is why did Newton draw the pictures that are in Yehuda 259 and in the Monty Snyder's? Um, manuscript, because most of his alchemical manuscripts are not full of pictures and don't have that kind of, and very, very relatively few of Newton's manuscripts show that sort of um, pictorial interest as distinct from diagrammatic interest. Interesting question. Um, I'm pondering and what I'm thinking at the moment is that um, Newton picked those particular images to copy because he thought they contained valuable information that might be useful in solving the alchemical riddles that were presented by the texts. If you look at uh, Monty Snyder's Metamorphosis Planetarum, the figure, um, of uh, you know the godlike figure sitting on a throne with his foot on each of those two little globes is in fact intended to represent Monty Snyder's himself, <laughs> which may say something about his uh, personal self-aggrandizement. But at any rate, the little globes um, are important for understanding the nature of the alchemy that follows. One of them, as far as I've been able to make out, represents Stibnite, the ore of antimony. And the other one, I'm sorry to say, seems to represent uh, nothing more uh, exotic than mercury, that is quicksilver. However, I'm not uh, completely satisfied with that interpretation. Monty Snyder's is one of the most obscure of all alchemists. Um, possibly equaling the great Zosimos of Panopolis himself. <laughs> um, and one can understand why Newton, you know, spent decade upon decade trying to decipher this guy. But I think the, the answer to your question is that, yes, Newton thought that those images bore clues to determining or to unraveling the literary texts that described in quite elusive terminology, the, the secrets of alchemical processes that Newton hoped to carry out in the laboratory. And I suppose one, I mean, one further question is just to check that you've, I mean, your argument about barred Jupiter, does that hold for all of Newton's writings or, or have you just looked in the alchemical papers? Yeah, that's, a, that's also a very interesting question. And the answer is I have not looked, obviously that, would be very interesting to do. I mean, in particular in dated correspondence, I noticed that the correspondence with Flamsteed had a barred Saturn. Of course, that uh, is not surprising because um, that was from the 1680s, right? When we know that Newton had already shifted over and even in the alchemical tax. But it would be interesting to know if in his early non-alchemical writings, Newton used the unbarred Saturn, and I do not know that yet. Mm -hmm. Stefan, I think you have a question. 
Yes, that's correct. Thank you so much for your presentations and uh, my greetings as well from Jerusalem. Um, my question goes uh, actually not so deep into the contents of Newton's writings, but uh, watching or, or having a look at these watermarks, I was wondering if you could say something about uh, the the producers of the paper Newton, Newton used, uh, like percentage. Did he have a, a certain manufacturer that he um, clearly um, uh, liked more than the others or um, where where have these papers been produced? Um, well, that, that's a question to which I'm hoping we may eventually begin to learn an answer. Um, I mean, one of the problems is that um, by the late, well, there are two, there are two related problems. Um, one problem is that um, the English paper trade was not uh, very good at producing English paper mills, were not very good at producing fine white paper for writing. So most um, fine white paper, which was imported into England, either for writing or printing, actually, was made in Newton's lifetime, either in France or in the Netherlands. However, um, there are some, there is some in native English uh, paper production, and it's actually growing in size in London and elsewhere in um, towards the second half of Newton's life, particularly. And there are also major English paper merchants who are, um, it, to a certain extent, monopolizing the trade in paper, one or two people, and who are acquiring paper from a number of sources. Um, and this raises some problems with watermarks as well, because um, it is both true that Dutch paper makers copied English watermarks and, and that English paper makers copied what were originally French or Dutch watermarks. So that um, identifying with any certainty what the place of origin of some of this paper is, is extremely difficult. You might think that paper with the arms of the seven provinces or the arms of Amsterdam, or also some other uh, forms that appear quite regularly in Newton's uh, corpus of paper, um, you know, must be Dutch paper. And you're probably right, it, it's very likely to be Dutch paper, but it, but it could be English paper as, as well. Um, now, um, one of the things that we aren't yet in a position to do, but I think would help with this, would be to look more broadly at the consumption of paper amongst Newton's Cambridge contemporaries, and to see whether, to what extent Newton's use of paper differs from, let's say, um, that of John Spencer. Now, we don't have much of Spencer's manuscripts from the 1680s, but we have um, the entire manuscript of his revision of the De Legibus for the second edition. So that's a lot of paper. And it would certainly be interesting to make that comparison um, and, and some other comparisons. There's quite a lot of Cudworth material in actually in London rather than in Cambridge, which one could compare. Um, but it is, it is problematic. I mean, Newton didn't buy his paper in the Netherlands, but the person who sold him the paper may well have bought it from a paper merchant who dealt regularly with the Netherlands. Thank you. Um, now, um, Mark Kolokowski, do you want to say something? I see you're in the chat. Yes, sorry. Yes, I've uh, written my question, actually. Um, so this is given Newton's habit to write and rewrite himself many times, to write, to, to re to write and rewrite himself large parts of his works many times. Why did he rely on Humphrey Newton as an amanuensis on that occasion? What does that tell us about the spe specifically about manuscripts written by Humphrey Newton compared to others? Well, that's an interesting question. It's an interesting question, actually, not just about Humphrey Newton, because, in fact, Newton used amanuenses um, and 
collaborated with people at the level of sharing manuscripts with them and getting them back with their comments on them or writing himself in other people's manuscripts pretty much throughout the time he was in Cambridge. Once he goes to London, it's a little bit more complicated, partly because a great deal of the paper that Newton is using once he's master of the mint is actually not his own paper, if you like, it's the mint's paper. Um, and and, and there, there, there are lots of people who might have access um, to some of it at some point or another. But um, whilst he's in Cambridge in, in, in the 1660s and 1670s, he has a stream of people who help him write things. And that continues in the 1680s um, with Humphrey Newton. Um, I mean, it, it isn't uncommon for 17th century writers to use amanuenses. Um, your question of what is the division of work is a very interesting one. Um, and it's one to which I think, I don't think I know the answer. Um, you might have an answer um, because as these pieces of paper show, um, uh, Newton is sharing material at an, at an unfinished point with Humphrey Newton and then revising the, the hand on the verso of uh, folio two of Yehuda 16.2 is Newton's own hand revising materials written out for him by Humphrey Newton. But on the other hand, he's also clearly drafting material, which Humphrey Newton is later copying out, probably with his involvement. And I mean, um, I mean, generally, amanuenses are being used to try and eventually produce fair copies of works. But here, here it's clear that we're still dealing with work at a compositional stage, even though the fair copy of the Principia is written in Humphrey Newton's hand, just as at an earlier stage, a good many of the things that Newton sent to the Royal Society about optics, or at least some of them, were written in the hand um, of John Wickens. Um, but no, some of Newton's correspondence is in other people's hands, I um, was written for him by amanuenses. Um, I think we have to revise, possibly even actually with regard to Newton's alchemy, I don't know what Bill would think here, we have to revise the idea of Newton as somebody working away secretively on his own, not sharing things with people, being afraid that information about what he was doing might, might leak out, which has kind of been an unfortunate consequence of Westfall's interpretation of Newton, um, and which leaves um, the very wide collaborations of the kind to which Derek and I were trying to allude in the beginnings of the slide sequence that I showed you. Uh, the very wide collaborations and context for Newton's work uh, is left rather in the shade by that. Bill, I don't know, do you have a... Well, yes, I, I agree completely about um... Newton's uh, collaborations being undervalued by previous scholarship. And what I'm thinking of, of course, in particular, is the collaboration with uh, Nicolas Fatio de Duye, which um, seems to have been much more significant than Westfall, Dobbs, or Figala thought, and involved uh, three or four people, you know, actively um, engaging in a process based, I think, on, on Monty Snyder's, again, uh, where Newton was sharing uh, recipes, essentially, with Fatio, and then Fatio was handing them off to an adept he was acquainted with, um, who apparently couldn't speak or write English, so Fatio was the intermediary. Um, all of this is extremely interesting, but getting back to um, the issue of amanuenses, um, I don't I can't think of any alchemical writings by Newton that were uh, copied by a scribe. I mean, I think it's all in Newton's hand. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't think of anything. Um, yes, I mean, there are things in other people's hands where those people and people who Newton knew, which are, but it's it, it's true. It's not, there isn't the, the degree of, uh, of sharing. There is evidence of people showing, of Newton showing people his laboratory, but there isn't evidence um, of shared composition 
um, in quite the same way in Newton's um, alchemical manuscripts, although there is evidence of collaboration, that there certainly is in both his scientific and um, some of his, well, his whatever we're going to call them, manuscripts which deal with questions of ancient philosophy and theology and including the, the history of Christianity. Derek, did you want to ask a question or add to this? You're muted. You need to unmute. There we are. Sorry about that. I had a sort of a question, you know, and, and partially a sort of a comment, you know, for, um, you know, for, for Bill, um, since, you know, it's, um, you know, he's here. Um, and, and Fadio, you know, in many ways, you know, acted as a partial amanuensis or Newton wanted him um, to assume the role of an amanuensis in certain respects. And this is why Fadio rebuffs um, Newton's, you know, Newton's entreaties to, to, to come to Cambridge. But when I was, when I was in the Wren, um, looking at um, the epistola of Edmund Dickinson, um, just just uh, three years ago, I, I, I noticed that Newton physically cross-referenced this with glosses to Johannes de Mont Snyder and the Metamorphosis of the Planets. Um, and you know, this couldn't have been this couldn't have been public, you know, done before 1686. You know, before just before the um, you know, the, you know, the, really during the composition of the Principia, you know, or immediately afterward. Um, and and I was sort of interested in in not just single books, but sets of books. You know, Newton was reading together. Um, Newton was physically, you know, marking them. You know, to link them, to cross reference them. And somehow, somehow, De Mont Snyder and and it's, it's um, and Dickinson are read as a set, as a pair, as a set of mutually supportive books, which is very similar to to similar clusters of books. Like really, you know, much earlier he would have been reading like the 1566 Ars Chemica, um, this collection of tractates um, by, um, you know, attributed to Hermes, you know, the, the Emerald Tablet and things together um, with, say, like an edition, uh, you know, like a volume of his Zetzner, you know, and and maybe, oh, maybe his, his um, Pierre-Jean um, Fabry. Um, you know, it's um, and and the way these 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 clusters of books seem to change over seems to be related to, to solutions to certain problems, you know, that he was working on at the time. And I, I, I'm really interested in in you, possible relationships between Dickinson, Mont Snyder, you know, and and this theory of vegetability Newton seems to be working on, you know, again in the late 1680s and early 1690s. Um, which, which yeah, I think do, do you want to try and, try and pick that up? Um, well, yes. I mean, Dickinson clearly was a key uh, interpretive source for Newton. Um, and actually, it's, very, it's a very useful one. He's a very useful one for us because, as you say, his book was printed in 1686. And consequently, we can use it you know, as a terminus post quim when we find it <laughs> referenced as it often is in his manuscripts. So uh, yeah, it's, it's a very useful uh, text for doing chronological work. As far as um, how it influenced Newton, that's also extremely interesting. And uh, I've touched on this in my book, but there's more that could be done with it. Essentially, Newton's interest in the corpus ascribed to the Majorcan 13th century philosopher Ramon Lull, the alchemical corpus, which is which consists of well over 100 works, all of which appear to be spurious. Um, apparently, yeah, that is uh, something that was triggered by reading uh, you know, the exchange between Dickinson and Mundanus. So that's rather interesting. That that seems to date from this period, you know, post-1686. And again, there's a lot more work that could be done on this than I was able to do in my book, but Newton's late Florilegia are heavily dependent on Lowell or pseudo Lowell. Um, and again, he brings this into connection with Mundanus, and he tries to use it to explain a host of different alchemical authors, including, as you say, Monty Snyder's, but also, of course, Irenaeus Philolathes, who is 
you know, up until I would say 1680 or so, Irenaeus Philalethes was by far Newton's favorite author in the alchemical realm, but he gradually comes to be supplanted by Monty Snyder's. So Newton is interested in interpreting all of these different figures and uh, his scope of interpretation uh, becomes broader and broader as time goes by. Uh, so that, you know, you've got this massive quantity of pseudo Lillian stuff that gets inserted into the mix post Mundanus. I mean, there's a lot more that can be said about this, but uh, I'll refrain. <laughs> I mean, I suppose just to conclude, because I guess that both our attendees would like to, to um, be released and that Tadosh would like to, to, to also to be released and have the channel released. I mean, that I mean, what what we're what we're trying to do actually involves I mean involves both uh, some extraordinarily um, detailed scholarship, not least the scholarship that Bill is talking about, um, and um, results in what appear to be possibly quite small changes to um things like dates or the order in which or what 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 Newton is reading or the order in which he reads things um but the consequences of that and I I mean I hope Bill would agree with this um are actually quite profound in altering the way in which one conceives um the intellectual activity of this person who has been held up in a whole series of environments as critically important for the development of certain, of changing certain kinds of intellectual activity. And also it does change the environment in which you set that intellectual activity. Um, and for that reason, I think, I hope both Bill, I hope Bill would agree with me. Um, there is um point in doing some of this apparently very um finickety work including the work that we're hoping to do or that we're engaged in doing with the watermarks um which you know, really is fundamental to trying to undo the harm done by the sale room to our ability to understand how newton himself conceptualized what he wrote and how um those writings passed across his desk and the desks as of, of others as they were composed. It, it, is that fair, Bill? Have I misrepresented your position or would you, you agree with that sort of summary? I would agree. And I would also say that um, in the context of the scholarship that's been done on Newton's alchemy in particular, um, things have changed radically because now we see that uh, Newton's alchemy was really not very closely related to his uh, work on theology and religious topics like prophecy, for example. Um, and that, of course, uh, runs against the view of, uh, in particular, Westfall and Betty Jo Teeter Dobbs, as well as some others. Um, in fact, Newton's alchemy was perhaps unsurprisingly <laughs> closely related to his scientific endeavors. However, that doesn't mean it was identical to them by any means because it involved an interesting uh, interaction between interpretation of mythology, interpretation of alchemical texts, actual laboratory experimentation, which I think distinguishes it clearly from his chronological studies, for example, that involved astronomy, uh, and so forth. So yeah, I think we are coming to a really very, very different view of uh, the, you know, alternative pursuits as they were perceived of Newton. Yes, and indeed putting both alchemy and indeed this kind of mythological work back into a context which has previously been separated out as scientific and, and, and to some extent separating it changing therefore a view of Newton either a view how one would see Newton as a whole if one wants to make the argument that Westfall and Dobbs made that one has to see everything as linked 
but changing that view or and also modifying the the counter view that actually they shouldn't be these you know somehow newton put up chinese walls that kept all of these things apart so with with that perhaps we can leave our audience and thank you very much for your your attention and your encouragement thank you very much for your presentations thank you thank you to the audience for coming and see you next month Take care. Thank you for moderating.